Welcome to the second session of this morning. Right. So the first talk is going to be on learning task-oriented um, grasping for tool manipulation with simulated self-supervision, and it's going to be presented by Kuan Fang. Good morning. I'm Kuan from Stanford. Uh, this talk is about learning task-oriented grasping for tool manipulation for, from simulated self-supervision. Tool manipulation is a vital skill for achieving generalizable robot autonomy. In this work, we aim to control a seven-dove robot arm to grasp unseen objects as tools and execute the desired tasks. There have been many recent works on learning to grasp unseen objects. Uh, the main challenge here is to formulate grasping as a learning problem and to collect large-scale data to train the model. Some of the previous works ask humans to annotate the ground truths positions of the grasps, some others uh, auto automatically generate robot trials in a self-supervised manner. Most previous learning-based grasping models do not consider the task constraints. Uh, for example, a, a, a grasp close to the center of mass can robustly lift up the object, but it might not be suitable for specific task constraints. For the hammering task, the robot is actually supposed to grasp the handle of the hammer and thus to generate a large enough momentum when hitting the pack. For uh, sweeping the clutter of the table, however, it is better to grasp the head of the hammer and sweep with the long handle. Most previous task-oriented grasping models either learn from a handcrafted quality metric or affordance labels annotated by human. This work relies on human uh, expertise of the task constraints, and they do not entail the success of the downstream manipulation tasks. So in this work, we aim to directly optimize for the task's success uh, by jointly choose a, a task-oriented grasp and its subsequent manipulation actions. We consider the two manipulation as a two-stage process. In the first stage, the robot grasps an object as a tool, in the second stage, the robot uses the tool to complete the goal of the task. Based on previous works, including GQCAN, we proposed our task-oriented grasping network. It is composed of a task-oriented grasping model and a manipulation policy. Uh, given the visual inputs of the object, we sample multiple grasp candidates. And depending on the task ID, our task-oriented grasping model predicts a task success probability for each candidate and chooses a grasp which corresponds to the highest predicted value. Then the manipulation policy outputs the action uh, for the selected grasp. We use convolutional neural networks for both of these two modules, and the neural network takes depth curves for each grasp candidate as the inputs. We develop a self-supervised learning framework to train the two modules jointly. Uh, so our model is uh, general to a diverse side of tasks. Uh, in this work, we focus on hammering and sweeping uh, to common but challenging tasks to run our experiments. And we roll out simulated robot trials uh, to uh, create, uh, collect a large-scale lab label data set and to uh, generalize to diverse objects. We procedurally uh, generate 3D uh, objects. We run our model in the simulation and evaluate the task success probability. After being trained with 1.5 million robot trials with uh, procedural objects, uh, our model is able to learn to use uh, unseen realistic shapes to perform the two tasks. We compare our models with the uh, baselines using random antipodo graphs and task agnostic graphs, as well as baselines using the man uh, random manipulation actions. Uh, we found that jointly learning the grasping model and the manipulation policy leads to the best performance. We also perform real-world e robot experiments using our model trained from simulation. And here, 
uh, the, there's no uh, explicit syn-to-real domain adaptation was used, and our model is proved to uh, use uh, nine and same real-world objects to perform the same tasks. Our model achieved uh, 80% and 71% task success rate for hammering and sweeping, respectively, which outperforms baselines using any Pardo and the task agnostic grasps. So in conclusion, we, uh, we propose a learning-based model for jointly optimizing for task-oriented grasping and tool manipulation. And we also develop a mechanism for generating large-scale simulated self-supervision with procedural objects. For further details, welcome to our poster and our website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guan. So the next paper is going to be learning complex dexterous manipulation with deep reinforcement learning and demonstration, and it will be presented by Arvind Radish Rajesh Varan. Sorry for that. Hey everyone, I'm presenting our work on uh, reinforcement learning for dexterous manipulation. So multi-fingered hands are among the most versatile manipulators and allow for a wide variety of interesting tasks, including in-hand manipulation and tool usage. However, this versatility comes at the price of high-dimensional observation and action spaces and complex contact patterns, which makes modeling and subsequent controller synthesis particularly challenging. Reinforcement learning provides a generic and model agnostic approach to synthesize controllers. Recently, DeepRL has demonstrated impressive results on a variety of locomotion and whole arm manipulation tasks, predominantly in simulation. Prohibitively large number of required samples and safety considerations prevent the direct use of reinforcement learning on hardware. Our goal is to reduce the sample inefficiency so that reinforcement learning can be used for real-world learning of diverse skills, and in particular, we focus on dexterous manipulation in this work. To this end, our first contribution is to set up a diverse suite of tasks with the 24 degree of freedom at right hand. Uh, what we see over here are the final train policies, and the talk is essentially about how to get here. So these tasks kind of bring about different challenges for reinforcement learning, such as exploration and functional approximation, and the agent has to carefully coordinate all the hand joints to manipulate the object of interest and complete the task. So let's first uh, observe what happens if we run uh, existing reinforcement learning methods on these hand tasks. Uh, we find that some algorithms, such as natural policy gradient and its variants, are indeed able to make some progress on these tasks after substantial reward shaping. Unsurprisingly, they still require hundreds of robot hours and hence are not very practical. Furthermore, the quality of motions are not entirely satisfactory, and the agent often employs idiosyncratic solution strategies as observed over here. So the primary challenge with uh, sort of reinforcement learning uh, with regard to sample efficiency is exploration. So in order to circumvent that problem, we collect a small number of human demonstration data using the Mujoko virtual reality setup. We note that straightforward imitation learning methods, such as behavior cloning, are not able to quite succeed on the hand tasks due to covariate shift and high dimensional uh, observation and action spaces. Uh, of course, collecting a large number of demonstrations could alleviate these difficulties to some extent, but it's not a very practical and scalable approach since collecting demonstrations is often difficult. So, so far, we have seen that both pure reinforcement learning as well as pure imitation learning methods don't quite succeed on these hand tasks. So what we, in some sense, require is to combine the generalization and autonomous learning capabilities of reinforcement learning with the small number of human demonstrations to circumvent the exploration challenge. Our minimalist approach for this, which we call demo-augmented policy gradients, constructs a surrogate function for the policy as an additive combination of the reinforcement learning surrogate and the behavior cloning surrogate. Subsequently, we perform natural gradient ascent on this composite objective function. Furthermore, we anneal away the behavior learning surrogate over iterations so that ultimately we solve for the reinforcement learning problem and optimize on the task reward measure. So uh, our DAPG algorithm is shown on the top left corner over here. Uh, what we observe is that the DAPG algorithm, when seeded with just 25 human demonstrations, is able to solve all the hand tasks that we consider in about five to six robot hours, which is orders of magnitude more efficient than pure reinforcement learning from scratch. We observe a number of additional benefits when using the DAPG algorithm as well. Uh, the, the quality of motions generated are substantially better and are more human-like, as can be seen on the right pane illustrated over here. 
Furthermore, due to the reinforcement learning part of the surrogate, the agent is able to autonomously learn and improve over the capabilities of the human demonstrator while still retaining the human style. Furthermore, the policies trained with DAPG are also more robust to variations in the environment. We illustrate this by changing the size of the ball to be manipulated and by making the ball into a cube. Note that the uh, agent is not trained on these new instances. We are just ch checking uh, robustness zero shot. We can see that the DAPG policy is able to cope with these variations, whereas the pure reinforcement learning policy is extremely brittle. So in summary, we find that combining reinforcement learning and imitation learning is a very promising approach for real-world learning of diverse skills. I would like to thank all my collaborators and all the institutions involved in this work. In particular, Vikash is a joint first author. Uh, in subsequent work, we have employed similar procedures on the hardware and also learning with direct visual inputs and find these results very promising. Some of these results are actually to be presented at a workshop in RSS, so please come check that out as well. And uh, do come and check us out at the poster session. Thank you. Thank you, Arvind. Okay, so the next talk will be on reinforcement and imitation learning for diverse visual motor skills, and it will be presented by Yuke Su. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Yuke Su. I'm a PhD student from Stanford University, and today I'm going to talk about uh, our work on deep visual motor learning, and this is a joint work with my colleagues uh, from DeepMind when I was summer intern last year. So in robotics, reinforcement learning has been established framework to learn controllers via trial and error. Uh, so uh, in classical approaches, and uh, they usually assume hand-crafted low dimensional features and a shallow model. And in recent years, and there has been growing interest of using deep neural network for reinforcement learning so that we can use this powerful function approximators to, to learn more complex behaviors end to end. However, to use deep reinforcement learning for robotics, and uh, we are faced with several major challenges. First, uh, real robot usually relies on raw sensory inputs that are usually noisy and high dimensional. And for, for real tasks, and they are really complex and, and have a long horizon, that leads to a significant challenge for exploration. And in this work, we focus on model-free methods that are flexible, but the downside is they really require a lot of data to train. So they have a very high sample complexity. So to address these three challenges, uh, we propose a three-stage learning pipeline uh, first, we use 3D motion controller to collect some human demonstration of the task. And once we collect the demonstrations and we use them to perform large-scale learning in parallel copies of physical simulation to learn this visual motor policy. And then once we learn the policy, we transfer the policy using a same to real trans policy transfer techniques to deploy that on the real robot. And to, uh, to, to guide the exploration of reinforcement learning, especially under sparse reward function, we propose two new techniques. First, we build a curriculum along the demonstration trajectory. So uh, basically, at the beginning of each training episode, we randomly, randomly start the episode somewhere along demonstration trajectories. Uh, so this encourages the agent to see later stage of the task earlier during training. And second, we develop a variant uh, of generative adversarial imitation learning, which adopts like a GAN, like a minimax learning objective. So it kind of encourages the policy to generate trajectories as close to the demonstration trajectory as possible. And to increase the robustness of our controller, so we use procedure generation to create an object with uh, varying shapes and, uh, and different physical properties. Uh, we also randomized the, um, the lighting condition, the arm dynamics for better generalization. So uh, this is a trick that allows us to transfer the policy from simulation to real robot. So to give you an overview of the model, uh, so the input to the policy is our RGB image from the camera and uh, the proprioceptive feature of the arm. And the output are nine degree of freedom joint velocity control command. 
uh, we propose to train the critic network on the physical states in simulation and also add auxiliary tasks to, st to stabilize and speed up training. And finally, uh, we, we, we propose a hybrid reward function that combines the imitation reward with the environment reward, such that by optimizing this hybrid reward function uh, using distributed policy grading method, while essentially doing uh, reinforcement learning and imitation learning simultaneously. So to show you some results here, while evaluating our policy in six manipulation tasks, so all six visual motor policies are trained with the same uh, algorithm, the same neural network architecture, and the same hyperparameter. So the, the approach is general. And uh, quant uh, qu quantitatively, we find that neither reinforcement learning nor imitation learning alone is able to solve the task. So the key to good performance is to combine both into a unified learning objective. And finally, we show that we can achieve some initial success of transferring the policy train only simulation uh, onto a real robot without any real world fine tuning. So, to summarize, uh, we propose a general framework to learn these visual motor policies, and we propose new, two novel techniques to leverage human demonstration to, to guide exploration and simplify uh, the challenge of exploration. And we perform same to real transfer techniques by diversifying the training conditions. And for more information, please come to our poster. Thank you. Thank you, Yuke. So the next talk will be on PushNet, deep planner pushing for objects with unknown physical properties, and it will be presented by Jukin Lee. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just introduce you just a rather very intelligent system, Jarvis, who is trying to serve you this box of chocolate. So you're trying to push a box towards the edge of the table to pick up, but sometimes she mess it up. So let's rewind the time to see what is happening. As you can see that what is happening, the box is still within the table. It shouldn't fall, but it turns out the one day ago, someone took out a few bars from the box, and as a result, the center mass is shifted, and hence the fall. But no worries, we're here to help. In this work, we propose the push net that learns to push objects with unknown physical properties such as shapes and center mass in a reliable and efficient manner. And my name is Jerry Quinn, together with my advisor, David Xu, and recently, we're from National University of Singapore. Push mechanics is largely governed by the physical properties of objects. And the key challenge here is exactly the unknown nature of those physical properties. And there are two types, non-visual and visual. Non-visual physical properties are not directly observable, such as the center mass, mass distribution, and friction coefficient. But nevertheless, we are able to push objects reliably on a daily basis, largely due to our ability to estimate those properties through history of interaction. Consider the same box with unknown center mass. We first push a box through its geometric centers and observe the box rotating clockwise. And this implies the center mass must lie on the right-hand side of the box and highlight in green. And we push for a second time at the three-quarter along the box. And this time, we observe the box rotating counterclockwise. So we can now further narrow down the possible location center mass. With a better estimation of center mass, we'll be able to select more efficient actions to achieve desired outcome. And this observation is supported by the voting theorems from Mason's early works. Still, this is not a complete story. We have to deal with the unknown visual properties, such as shapes and sizes. And recent success of deep learning to extract visual representations inspired us to adopt a data-driven approach. So to this end, we propose PushNet, a recurring neural network that embeds history interaction while estimating the center of mass. So here's an architecture. So there's three input to the network. The MT is the current image that captures objects, geometry, and the current pose. MT plus one is the target image that we want the object to be at the next time step. And both images pass through four convolution layers to form the corresponding feature vectors. Another input to network is a set of push action candidates. 
the candidates are sampled randomly based on the current image. So each red arrow here indicates a valid push action. So we embed history of interaction using an LSTR module, which had two outputs. So one is the estimation of center mass on the 2D plane, and the other is the predicted feature vector as the next time step. And finally, we took the difference between the predicted feature vector and the target feature vector and output the similarity score, which measures how good an action is to push an object from the current state to the target state. An action with the best similarity score is chosen to be executed by the robot. And the loss function captures both the loss in the similarity score as well as the estimation of center mass. And we collect push interaction simulation for 60 objects of different shapes with randomized center mass. And we train the network entirely using simulated data. And for experiment evaluation, we aim to answer these two questions. First, to verify the importance of history for robustness, we compare pushnet with a version of pushnet without using LSTM module. And the result shows pushnet more robust than one without using LSTM modules. It achieved over 97% success rate in simulation. And second, to verify estimating center mass really helps to select more efficient actions, we compare pushnet with the one without estimating center mass. And the result shows pushnet is more efficient than the one without estimating center mass. It takes fewer number of steps to achieve the desired outcome. And now Jarvis is more confident to push a great variety of objects with unknown physical properties in a reliable and efficient manner. So now let's go back to the problem we are facing at the start. So right now Jarvis is trying to push a box while estimating the center mass showing the green dot. It pushes the box in a way that to cap away the center mass from the table edge to prevent the fall. And now it's able to pick up and the problem is solved. To find out more how you can apply PushNet to your robots, come talk to me in the post session. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you, Jokun. So I'd like to ask all speakers to the stage and just to stand in the same order as you gave your talk. So this is the Q&A session. You may ask questions. So the green box first. Hi, I have a question for the second speaker. Um, so first, oh, I'm over here. First, I mean, it's interesting that optimizing for the combination of two functions achieves different behavior than optimizing for each of the functions individually. I wouldn't have seen that one coming. Anyway, I, I have two separate questions. The first is, it seems that a lot rises and falls on the value of lambda, which presumably does not work well for one system as it does for another. So aren't you swapping out the time saved in robot R's for the time saved, uh, time used to hypertune the, you know, tune the lambda hyperparameter of various systems? Uh, the second question more generally is, people have worked on RL and IL for a while. People have, the same people have worked on both these things. What do you think they've missed in that they didn't combine this before? So like what, should we go back and apply RL DAPG to every problem that imitation learning didn't work well in? So do you have any broader thoughts on that? Uh, okay, the first question was regarding how to pick lambda. So uh, it, it is a good question. And in the paper, we kind of use like a heuristic on how to pick lambda, which, which is largely based on the advantage of the on policy samples. And we found that that particular uh, approach works really well. But there are other ways to combine it. For example, like uh, use like a, a rep style approach where we take like uh, Q values of the, of the demonstration rollouts and integrally use them. And uh, the second question is like, uh, comparisons to, in some sense, prior work. So I would say that uh, algorithmically, uh, there are some novelties, but we are not going to claim that you know, people have not looked at similar approaches in the past. Uh, what is really exciting is that it's a very simple approach, yet it gives extremely good results. And simplicity giving good results is always a good thing, so maybe that's, like, uh, that's the way I think of it. The orange box. Um, I actually have a question for both for Arvind and Rika. Uh, since you have involved human demonstration in your RL framework, and uh, I wanted to ask, have you collected uh, uh, human demonstra demonstration data in various environments to like, enhance the robustness of your learned policy? Uh, so uh, I didn't fully get the question. My, uh, the question was like, 
does the human demonstrations contribute to the robustness? Is that the question? Yeah, I, my question is, uh, have you collected the human demonstration data in various environments? Since you finished the task, in, uh, you see you have a robotics for various environments. i just curious about have you collected uh, demonstration uh, data? Yeah. Yeah, so we have collected demonstration data on the hardware, if that's what you're asking, and that's kind of the follow-up work. Uh, it, it, the similar approaches are indeed kind of showing promise on hardware as well. Um, as you can see, like the way we train the policy is by like in cranking up the level of randomization. So when we collect the demonstration, we also collect the demonstration with this kind of randomization with procedure generated shapes and also like randomized lighting and the physics. But uh, one technical detail I should mention is uh, our model is actually very efficient in terms of the numbers of the number of demonstration necessary to train the policy. So for each of the six tasks I show you, uh, each task we are training with 30 demonstration only. So that can be collected within half an hour using this like 3D mouse. So the trick is because we are using this technique called the generative adversarial imitation learning. That's very efficient in terms of the demonstration you need, but uh, the downside is that you have to interact with the environment to learn the policy. So the, the, the sample efficiency will, will be not good enough to train on the real robot. More questions? I see one there, the green box maybe? Let's do the orange one first. Hi. Um, my question is for the second author. So um, in your demo, you show that there are some artifacts for training with only model-free approaches. I wonder what are the disadvantages of such artifacts, and especially like in case where human demonstrations are not optimal, does your imitation learning downgrade your performance? Uh, so. Uh we as roboticists really care about like kind of human-like motions. Uh, so in some sense, having idiosyncratic uh, solution strategies are not uh, kind of very appealing. Uh, furthermore, we also show that as a consequence of these idiosyncratic solution strategies, you also don't get robustness. So any minor variations in the environment kind of really puts off the policy. Uh, with regard to suboptimality of the demonstrations, as we showed in some of the demos, the, the autonomous or combining RL or the DAPG algorithm is able to improve upon the performance of the human demonstrator. So in some sense, our uh, demonstrations are indeed suboptimal, but yet they are uh, serving a good purpose for bootstrapping and subsequently learning. But of course, the reason for turning down the lambda parameter that they showed up was to kind of get rid of this bias of uh, suboptimal demonstrations. So, uh, if we anneal that away, eventually we solve on the task reward measure, so we are indeed getting to the optimal policy. Can we take one last question from the green box? Uh, hi, um, so this question is for Aravind. Um, so you were saying, okay, the first question is, uh, I wanted to know whether your reward function is the same a shape reward function or a sparse reward function. If it was a shape reward function, the fact that you're annealing lambda would essentially get you the same idiosyncratic behaviors that you had because you would again be optimizing the shape reward function. So in a way, you're not really getting around the problem that shape reward functions lead to behaviors that you cannot expect, um, and imitation learning is somehow getting around that. But yeah, annealing lambda wouldn't really solve the problem. So what are your thoughts? Uh, so uh, we are, in some sense, solving really hard non-convex optimization problems, so global optimality guarantees are out of the window. Uh, essentially, the way I think about it is that uh, we are not really optimizing for uh, a special cost function. So the true cost function that we want to optimize is in our head, and it's basically maximizing the researcher's happiness. We are trying to mathematically distill that down into some reward function and giving it to an optimization method. And translation from what's there in our brain to what's written down is where some problems are uh, arising. So. Uh, Human demonstrations provide another way to put in the correct human prayers to get out what we want. And uh, in some sense, uh, I think it biases the solution uh, towards better optimality regions where uh, better looking motions are observed. But of course, uh, the question of what happens if we get to a global optima with like a shaped reward function is of course uh, hard to answer. So I would kind of uh, leave that out. Okay, um, let's thank uh, the speakers again.